This is the Smallmouth Crush Podcast Season 2. If you're a hardcore angler, you've come to the right place. This podcast that will interview some of the top local and regional anglers in North America. Anglers who consistently finish near the top in both largemouth and smallmouth bass fishing tournaments. Travis and his guest will discuss techniques and strategies used to help these anglers stay so consistent and help you become a better angler and gain an edge on your body of water. And now, here's your host of the Smallmouth Crush Podcast, Travis Manson. Hello, welcome to the Smallmouth Crush Podcast. My name is Travis Manson, and we're talking with some of the top local and regional tournament anglers all over the country. Well, not even, not only the U.S., but also Canada. So let's just call it North America, some of the top sticks. And we're learning a lot along the way, a lot of great information. If you guys are new, this is the Smallmouth Crush Podcast. We also have a YouTube channel called Smallmouth Crush. And we put out a lot of great fishing content throughout the years. We have a live show we do every week. All kinds of good stuff on over there at Smallmouth Crush on the YouTube uh, platform. And, of course, this podcast is also broadcasted throughout all the other podcast platforms out there. And I'm really, really looking forward to talking to this week's guest. I think we're going to talk a little smallmouth fishing as well. So that'll be pretty, pretty exciting. It's been a while. We did a whole season one talking with the top smallmouth anglers and we couldn't get to them all. There was a lot of them. There was a lot of them, but a lot of great information. I encourage you to take a look at some previous podcasts, a lot of tons of knowledge, many, many, many hours. And don't get mad at me when you break out your wallet and you go broke buying all this fishing tackle these guys are talking about because it's crazy. I'm guilty of it as well, and uh, definitely want to get into the show, but we have to talk about The Real Shot, of course. The Real Shot's been a sponsor of this podcast. If you're a brand-new shopper over there at therealshot.com, you can use my code, smallmouthcrush15. You're going to get 15% off your first order. They got a lot of great bass gear, anything and everything, walleye, salmon, trout, a bunch of hunting equipment as well. So head on over to therealshot.com and check them out. And we're going to bring this week's guest on. Derek, how are you? Good, Travis. How are you? Very good. I'm really looking forward to talking with you and getting inside your head when it comes to uh, bass fishing. But before we go there, I'm going to have a bunch of questions for you. If you could just take a moment and perhaps introduce yourself a little bit to the viewers and people watching this on the uh, YouTube channel, just a little bit more about yourself, where you're from, and some of the bodies of water that you fish on a regular basis. Yeah, so I live on a pretty popular uh section of Lake St. Clair. I'm located right in Bell River, Ontario. Anybody that's fished Lake St. Clair, they know the Bell River hump. Uh, I'm lucky enough to live three minutes from wow. literally Lake St. Clair. Grew up fishing Lake St. Clair my whole life. St. Clair, Detroit River, Lake Erie. A lot of multi-species going up, a lot of walleye fishing, little musky fishing, but kind of fell in love with tournament fishing back in about 2011 when I fished my first BFL as a co-angler. So 2011, you entered as a co. How long did you stay fishing on the co-angler side? I did it for about a couple of years. I kind of got addicted my very first one. I got a lucky draw from, uh, I actually drew Heath Wagner, which at the time sure. I was told he's the smallmouth guru of St. Clair and you couldn't draw somebody better. And so Heath gives me a call and he goes, you know, any other day I would say I'm the best guy to draw, but he goes, I hadn't had a pre-fished in. So we're just going to go fishing. Wow. And we decided that morning to make a 60 mile run all the way to Lake Erie, basically. And we had a blast, didn't do very well, but uh, kind of fell in love with the game after that. It sounds like it. What, what was your biggest takeaway? I mean, let's look, let's talk about Heath and, and being out with an angler like that. As far as advice that you could give to perhaps other co-anglers that are, when they get paired up with someone that really has their game on like what what are you trying to accomplish that day or what, what what was your biggest takeaway from that event my whole thing was just to be a sponge like gain as much information as i possibly can in an eight hour day with somebody talk as much as you can ask questions you know try to be as much familiar with the scene as they are and take a little bit of knowledge every time you get a chance to get on the boat with one of these great guys i was lucky enough as a co-angler i had lots of great draws I actually won one my very first year on the St. Clair River, which was awesome. But that's the best advice you can give. Just be a sponge. Be courteous. Remember you're in their boat. Respect all their belongings and stuff like that. But it's mostly just 
you know, try to absorb as much information you can about any technique, any patterns, anything, because I promise you, you're going to use it down the line. So the first year fishing as a co, you ended up winning one and that was on your body of water on St. Clair. What, what did you end up doing? Uh, I drew Scott Michael from Wonderland Marine West. We actually left from, uh, I believe it was Elizabeth Park on the Detroit River. And we ran all the way up to near the mouth of Lake Huron. Hmm. Uh, he said in the morning, we were going to go for a very long run. We might make a stop on the way. Uh, we made a stop. I think I caught a three pounder in my first cast on the tube. And he goes, Kate, we're out of here. That was what we needed to do. And Scott kind of went on like a little bit of a smash fest for a little while. He put, okay. you know, eight. 18, 20 pounds in the boat pretty quick when we pulled up to the first spot. We were fishing deep current, middle of August, like 27 feet of water, even jigging a tube, dragging a tube. And I finally caught one and Scott went to net it and the net actually broke. And it, and it was a six pound, two, two ounce Whoa. smallmouth. We bear hugged it into the boat. Uh huh. Um, and from there on in, it was just a blast. It was what do you the, 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 like the net handle or the actual net itself? The net itself actually caved in and broke. Oh, geez. Ro just, wow. No rhyme or reason what happened. So we so, were bear hugging fish off the side of the boat. So the you got a day. three pounder and then that six, right? Yeah. And then did you catch, did you get your limit? I assume. Yeah, we, we went on to catch multiple, multiple four pounders. I ended up, I think I had 22 and a half. If I recall, Scott had around 20, 21, but it was like multiple, like four, 4.1 to 4.4 fish. And then the six, two kind of really yeah. gave the win. So you had a pretty good day. You're feeling good going in. What were, what was on both of your minds? Did you think you both potentially were going to be right up there? So when I, when we were on our way back in, we were actually worried because we didn't give ourselves enough time to stop and get fuel. Uh, he had a brand new Stratus and we had a very long run. I think we had about 50 miles to go and we had about 40% fuel left. And when we pulled up, we were about a mile down. It, it went down to 5% and Scott looked at me and he took a breath and he's finally he's like, yeah, we're going to make it. <laughs> but it was a very long, you know, um, uh, stressful run not knowing if we we're actually going to make it back or not and sure knowing the potential of bag that i well i had i thought i could win and he thought i could win and he knew he had enough to cash a check so yeah that's very cool it's amazing looking back you know whether it be a co-angler or a, a boater just winning an event how vivid that day you probably remember it like it was yesterday and and the stories that come with it they'll always be with you i think that's one thing that at least for me, it, that's what drives me as a, a tournament angler. You know, you stepping out and, and becoming a boater, when did that occur? Was that a little bit later than, you know, two, three years later? Yeah, a little bit later. I'm going to say about 2014, 2015. I did a couple BFLs as a pro, had a couple top tens, caught, cashed a couple checks, uh, didn't really overly succeed in it, and then uh, started fishing more of the Canadian side, like team tournaments, circuits. Mm -hmm. What do you prefer? Do you like the the boater, non-boater, or do you like the team events? I like them both, to be honest. It's just being in Canada, crossing the border, et cetera. Sometimes it gets a little tough making all the tournaments in the U.S. Uh, being so close to so many great events here in Canada, it's, it's kind mm -hmm. of, we're spoiled. The caliber of competition on both sides of Canada and U.S. is, is phenomenal. They're, these guys are getting better and better. And if you're not getting better and learning every day. You're getting left behind pretty quick, unfortunately, in this game now. Now, I, I'm sure you know how to catch largemouth, and I'm sure you love doing that, but I really want to focus a little bit more on, on smallmouth as well and, and kind of find out what, what makes you tick when it comes to these brown these brown bass. I mean, I'm, I'm fascinated with them. For one, it's the areas – and the scenery and the terrain that you catch smallmouth in for me, that's what, that's what gets me going. And St. Clair is just a gorgeous place to fish. There's so many different opportunities. There's, I mean, the water is just gorgeous, right? I mean, it's uh, there's nothing like it. There's nothing like it on all the great lakes. There's just something special about that. What is it about St. Clair that you just, you're so passionate about? The thing about St. Clair, what I love is honestly, you can drive your boat any direction at any time, shut down and probably catch a smallmouth. Like it's just loaded from every corner, from four feet to 22 feet to the channel mouths to literally you can catch them anywhere. Um, it's just ice finding those isolated schools that usually when you find a mega school, it's somewhere between half a mile to a mile box. I call them 
uh, like kind of like a football, a couple football fields, uh, big type deal. And when you can find that school, that's where you're going to have the fun. What's some advice you can give to an angler that's looking at exploring St. Clair for the first time? Because it is, it can be very intimidating. I know you said you can pretty much go anywhere and catch them, but how do you consistently find some of those bigger fish? There's not a, at least in my experience, the, the structure, right? It's kind of known as a featureless body of water for the most part. The best advice I can give or the way I've learned is you got to find something different, whether it be a weed line, a sand spot, a little hard spot on the bottom, a shell bed. There, there's all kinds of different little things they hold on. What I personally do before the cabbage gets too tall, because we get cabbage that comes all the way up to 20 feet in some areas of this lake, especially around the Belver Hump. You know, that early May, June, I'm already out scanning that lake because it changes every year. Like I'm trying to find a little bit of a different, whether it be a dark spot or a hard spot or a little vein that you can't see once the weeds kind of get up that high. Just side scan, it's just impossible. You can't really see past all those big weeds sometimes. With that being said, sometimes those big smallmouth just sit right in the heart of those big weed beds and they come out into a little sand spot and you know you'll catch five six seven on that sand spot and they come out you can literally see a whole wolf pack come out of those weeds sometimes but i like to target like little sand grass areas something that's different you know with some hard bottom around it is is the key to what i like to fish out there so there's a lot that goes into you know locating these fish what's your favorite technique or way to actually catch them once you do find them yeah, I do a lot of different techniques. Every time I'm out, I try to learn something new. But ever since uh, forward-facing sonar, live scope, I have a really hard time putting down a drop shot. Mm -hmm. It's just so efficient. Um, you learn so much from fishing it, the way fish react, the way they don't react. Sometimes they sulk. Sometimes they come up 10 feet to eat it. You just can learn so much from just tossing a drop shot out on that lake. And it, it's kind of becoming a staple now. With that being said, I like throwing a lot of moving baits, a swim bait. You literally can't go wrong on St. Clair. You can catch them from, you know, opening day all the way to the fall. The tube, it's kind of, I feel like pastime now. I don't even hear of guys throwing a tube out there as much You're right. anymore. Yeah. yeah. And it, it's, it's a staple. It's always got to be on the deck of your boat because they may not eat it every single day, but there's going to be days where that's all they're going to eat, but we're kind of getting spoiled with this, you know, live scope. Now it's just, you're learning so much about these fish and the way they relate to structure and how they react to different baits and colors. And, but if I had to pick one, it's definitely a drop shot. Yeah. Especially with live scope, it's become, I, I know what you mean. It's, it's very addicting for those that haven't experienced that yet. It's coming. I mean, uh, you know, everyone, they're getting more serious. Like pretty much every angler who's competitive nowadays has one. And it's just a matter of time before a majority of the weekend anglers get one five, 10 years from now, who knows where it's going to go. But right now it's one of the most important ways to exactly like what you're saying, learn how those fish react, see them actually follow the bait, how they react to the bait and, and seeing your bait itself at, on a long cast. I mean, there's nothing like it, and it's hard to put that that technique down when it's uh, when it's going. It's tough when I'm pre-fishing or something. I'm throwing a moving bait, but even at that point, I'm following it in every single cast, just seeing if there's something following it, or if a fish is coming off the bottom and looks at it and turns away, and then I'm trying to flip at them and figure out why that happened, or if they're high in the water column, by baiting. Ex perfect example: seeing a spy bait come through it with suspended smallmouth it's game changing compared to the way it used to be. Like you can see a fish follow it and then toss something finesse at them to get them to bite. That's, that's interesting. So spy baiting, of course, you know, last year on the podcast, we had a lot of top smallmouth anglers and that was, especially in the great lakes. That was one of the techniques that came up quite a bit. I know there's still a lot of anglers that don't use them. There's a lot of anglers that have used them and not have a lot of success with them. And it takes a little bit, at least I feel to really get it dialed in and it's an effective technique. It's one I actually don't use a whole lot of, of course I always have one tied on, but I tend to uh, gravitate to some other ones, but I would love to learn a little bit more about your setup and, and where you're fishing that, because I know it's an important technique that I need to master at some point. I throw it when I need to. Mm -hmm. I don't love it. 
I would rather catch him on just about any other technique, to be honest. Sure. But uh, there is times you need to do it and you need to know how to do it. And uh, the proper line, I'm a big fan of, you need to have the proper gear to get that technique to work is most effective and in, and keep the fish pinned for the most part. I throw it on a six pound fluorocarbon, straight fluorocarbon. Some guys throw it on a braid to a fluorocarbon leader. I just throw it on six pound fluorocarbon. I throw it on a seven, six medium light rod. Actually the new tactical fishing gear rod, the Ned rod, um, it's actually a stellar spy bait rod. I kind of figured that out this year by doing it, but it gives you a nice long cast and it's super light and parabolic to kind of keep the fish, you know, set up and pinned when you do get bit. So six pound floral. And as far as a reel, I assume it's a spinning rod, right? Yeah. Yep. Spinning rod. As far as real size goes, you 2,500, a 3,000 guy, 4,000? I've actually switched to a 3,000 uh, Vanford HG this mm -hmm. year on a spy bait rod. Uh, it just slows it down just a tad. It's really painful, I call it, to be disciplined to know how fast you got a reel. And forward-facing sonar, literally, you can watch what you're doing now. So it kind of, it's not guessing where your bait is, if you're reeling too fast, you kind of pick up your cadence based on literally watching it on your sonar. All right. I know I got, I, I got so many things running through my head right now because I want to, <laughs> I want to get back to, you keep bringing up live scope and being able to follow your baits. And I think, I think I, I definitely know I want to talk to you about this. I want to get back to uh, the spy bait, of course, but when you're talking about following the bait, for me, as much as I do it, sometimes it's really difficult for me to get that that live scope lined up perfectly on a cast and, and to fish that. Do you have any tips or any ways that you uh, utilize it that you found over the last couple of years now using that technique, uh, using that live scope to be able to follow your bait more importantly? Because that's like that's what everyone sees or, or when they think live scope, not only do they think about the fish that they see in real time, but the bait, and I know there's a lot of anglers that are struggling to be able to find their bait when they're out there looking at, you know, what are they looking for? What are they, what are we trying to do here to see our bait on live scope? So the way to, I'm feel I'm most successful with it. I take about a 45 degree angle on the front of my boat and that's about where I cast for the most part. Um, kind of fan cast at 45 degree angle. I can keep my trolling motor semi straight in those areas where if i'm moving forward i can get it, i can't get it on the bait the whole way in um in calmer water it's a lot easier obviously mm -hmm. but if i can see you know 20 feet of that 60 to 70 foot range that's pretty successful you can learn a lot in that 20 feet whether or not your bait's too high in the water too low if there's a fish behind it one comes up maybe your bait's hitting the top of the weeds and you want it to be a foot higher it's not just about watching fish and your bait come through the water. It's it's kind of more learning, you know, your speed, your technique, and how to just be more successful and, I guess, more uh, efficient with it, I guess, is mm -hmm. the word. So you mentioned there's a time and place for the spy bait. You don't always throw it, but there's sometimes, there's some days when you have to. What would be like the ideal conditions for a spy bait? Is it cloudy? Is it windy? Is it sunny? Is it calm? What is it? On St. Clair, if you have very calm water, even up to a slight ripple and pure sun, it's tough to beat it some days. Um, you know, they had that tournament, I believe it was uh, the FLW that was here. Uh, Hayes and Grigsby just put on a clinic with that thing. Soon, And they knew exactly when to switch it over. As soon as the sun come up, it got a little bit calmer and they start throwing it and putting six pounders in the boat. It's... Mm. It's about a timing thing. I don't throw it if there's any wind whatsoever or cloudy for that matter. I'll still throw a swim bait. I'll still throw a crank bait, a moving bait, but they really need to see it. They come okay. a long way sometimes to get that spy bait. So it's, uh, it's one of the techniques that just need the right conditions to maximize. Not saying you're not going to catch them on other things, on other days and other conditions, but for the most part, it has to be the right conditions for me to pick it up and throw it. I'm going to ask you a couple of questions surrounding yeah. when to throw it and, and why, of course. So if, if we have sun, if we have calm conditions, and let's say we're out there in that 18 to 22 foot range and there's something going on, you know, whether it be uh, a grass edge or a little depression or maybe a rise, you just, you see the fish, you know, they're there. 
And let's say they're fairly close to the bottom. You know, give us a couple examples when and how you would be swimming that through the water column. Have have you seen where you can be 10 feet down over 20 and those fish will come up? Or do you have to get it closer to those fish? What's your experience in trying to get a bite with that bait? To be honest, it, it changes all the time. Sometimes they want it down 18 feet over 20. Sometimes they want it 10 feet over 20. It's kind of just trial and error. I always usually start about the 10 foot mark. I use my sonar. If I'm seeing fish suspended, you know, 12 feet, I'm trying to keep it around 10. If I'm seeing mm -hmm. fish at 14, I'm trying to keep it around 12. They'll come up and eat it. Um, I've seen them come up from, you know, 20 and eat something that's six feet under the surface, like a messed up crankbait or something. I've, I've seen a lot of, they come a long ways to eat when they're hungry. But for the most part, I'd probably say I try to keep it between that 10 to 14 foot range occasionally i'll keep it on the bottom or close to the bottom just at that point you're getting a lot of perch and walleyes and everything else that uh lives down there and st Clair is just an unbelievable fishery for just about anything it sure is what about brand is there a particular brand of spy baits because it seems like every company out there has a particular one what's your favorite i pretty well just throw the duo 90. i'd like the 90 i can throw it a long way um, I haven't branched off and tried as many. There's a lot that look awesome. There's a lot of different colors. It's mm -hmm. just kind of one of those the confidence baits where if it works, don't change type deal. <laughs> yeah. How about colors? Do you get real, real creative with, uh, with your color choice or do you try to keep it basic? Uh, I only really throw a couple different colors, um, bait fish colors. Most of the fish are feeding on a perch or an emerald shiner for the most part all summer. Perch pattern or the just an emerald shiner pattern okay. is usually my favorite. Well, Derek, there's a lot that goes into spy bait and sounds like you got it dialed in. It's one of those things where we know we got to throw it, but we don't always love to throw it, but it certainly gets the job done. So some great information. I took a bunch of notes. Now I got to go spend some more money on, uh, on baits. What do you know? But listen, we're going to take a quick break and we're going to be right back. <laughs> You're listening to the Small Mouth Crush Podcast. Don't rush out to the water just yet. We'll be right back after this break. You know, I really enjoy helping people become better anglers. And you can head on over to smallmouthcrush.com. And I'm offering a one-on-one -on -one meeting. Basically, it's an hour meeting over the computer. Where we'll break down and talk about anything and everything fishing related. Whether you want a new set of eyes on a body of water that you fish on a regular basis or perhaps plan for an upcoming tournament, techniques, tips, whatever it may be. I've had a lot of fun working with anglers over the last year or two with this project. Smallmouth Crush one-on-one. -on -one. If you're interested, sign up and let's schedule something together. All right, great stuff. I got to ask, as far as tournaments and, and team events or whatever the case may be, besides St. Clair, do you get outside of that zone? And, and what's your tournament schedule and scene kind of look? Uh, last year, I went up to fish the uh, Thousand Islands Open uh, on the St. Lawrence, Lake Ontario. Um, was probably one of my favorite tournaments. Getting away from grass and fishing some hard structure on contours was... Uh, Definitely a big change. And then uh, also fish the Lake Erie Open, Canadian Tire Lake Erie Open on uh, Eastern Lake Erie down on the Niagara River. Kind of sets up similar to Lake Ontario. So uh, absolutely fell in love with that tournament too. So those are two definitely coming back on my list in 2022. And as far as events in Canada, there is some amazing, like it's like, like big time tournaments, even team events. Do you get involved in some of those? Do you fish in the inland bodies of water as well? Uh, just recreational. I haven't really branched out living down on St. Clair. It's, it's right. sometimes tough. You're so spoiled to having it, you know, 10 minutes from your house. Uh, Simcoe is a stellar lake for smallmouth. Rice Lake, stellar lake for smallmouth. There's so many in Canada. Um, there's so many that aren't even heard of that have giant smallmouth going further mm -hmm. north. But for the most part, it's mostly St. Clair. And I'm, like I said, I'm adding those two into it next year again. What do you think makes you so successful when it comes to the tournament scene? You know, there's a lot of great anglers out there, but it seems like to be consistent, there's always just a handful of guys, you know, 15, 20 guys, pretty much every event, you know, you're, they're cashing checks. What is yeah. it about, you know, how do you stay consistent? What kind of advice can you give someone that's thinking about maybe like yourself, 
Maybe they fished as a co-angler. They want to make that step up to a boater. Where does one start? There's two things I've always said. You can't put a price on time on the water. And the second thing is every time you're on the water, try to learn something new, whether it be why the fish are relating, maybe a technique you're not so strong in, uh, different conditions. I try to learn something every time I'm on that lake, even on St. Clair, my own backyard. I try to learn something every time I'm out there and take that knowledge and utilize it uh, because you're going to need it one day. Mm-hmm. But you you can't replace time on water. Like that's the number one key. You got to be out there. You got to take the time. If you want to be successful, you got to spend, a, you know, four or five days before a tournament out there. Not hit the same waypoint every single day mm-hmm. trying to make it work. Sometimes they just aren't there. As much as smallmouth can be patterned, they just as well vanish as just as fast, to be honest. There's that's lots so of times true. where they just, they're gone. <laughs> I call mm-hmm. them MIA or rogue fish. They just leave. Right, right. And it happens. Over the last couple of years, has there been any particular baits or techniques that you've really got dialed in and picked up on that maybe you haven't used a whole lot in the past? Yeah, I've kind of, we are talking about spy baiting on the other side. I've kind of got really familiar with throwing a finesse swim bait. Um, I used to only throw a big 4.8 Kytec. St. Clair smallmouth are perch eaters. Um, so I was trying to get a bait that was big enough to, kind of mimic a perch and trying to get a bigger bite all the time. But uh, now I've kind of gone down to that two, eight, three, three swim bait and really utilizing how you throw it. It's, it's a very versatile bait. You can throw it a lot of different ways, fish it a lot of different ways as well. So a real tiny swim bait versus some yeah. of the larger ones is what you're focused on. I kind of learned it from a co-angler in a BFL, to be honest. He caught two six pounders in the back of the boat, drop shotting a little crappy swim bait, a white one. Hmm. Ever since then, I've kind of just kept it in the back of my head that, you know, it doesn't need to be a big bait to catch a big fish all the time. And I'm right. I'm right there with you. I get a lot of heat sometimes from my buddies, you know, big baits, big fish. I listen, I'm right there. I, I'll take the tiniest bait and catch some of the biggest fish you can imagine. It's one of my passions when it comes to different techniques. And I love like just knowing like crappie size plastics if you will Agreed. that's what i love to do and it's so efficient it's it's a lot of fun the bites are great light line medium light rods you know you're you're feeling you're, you're one with the bait i feel the smaller the bait the more you're with that bait at, at a personal level i know that sounds weird but that's just how i envision it and see it and i know with the waters with the clarity that you have i mean lake st Clair, all the great lakes a lot of the inland lakes up north all those lakes set up for baits like that. And not only is it effective in those conditions, think about all the other baits that are out there and all the other anglers and all the pressure that these fish see. I mean, St. Clair, you know it, right? There's, yeah. there's a lot of pressure out there. I can't imagine a, a weekend, right? Besides the pleasure boaters. I heard that's a crazy place to party in the summer too. I've seen the pictures. If you pull up on Metro beach in midsummer and you're fishing that flat, I call it the washing machine because it's unbelievable. The boat wake over there. Canada's not as bad on the Canadian side, but we do get the residual. There's just not as many marinas and as many pleasure boats per square mile of St. Clair as there is on that, on the U S side. I'm thankful for that sometimes. Oh, sure. I, I got to ask, being as close as you are to Lake Huron, and you mentioned fishing a little bit of that. When I look at a map of the Great Lakes, Huron to me is one of the lakes that, besides, say, Superior, or maybe even, you know, I always, oh God, there's so many places I look at and I wonder, right? There seems like there's a lot of potential. Have you explored that? Do you know of anyone really actively getting way, non, I'm not talking about tournament waters like that far stretch. Have you looked into any of that stuff and are you impressed by, is it kind of a dead zone? What are your thoughts? Huron has a lot of very good water. It also has a lot of dead water. Um, I practice up there a lot. I've never had a day yet where I could say I can go up there and win a tournament. I do know guys have done it. Guys have gone gone a long way on the Canadian shoreline and even farther on the American shoreline. Here on coming into the St. Clair River, within that like half mile stretch, that current's flying. You're over two miles an hour. It, it's similar to fishing the Niagara River type deal. But that being said, they load up there sometimes. 
I've always gone up there and caught one, two here or there, and they're usually good ones. It's just a long run a lot of the time and may not be overly rewarding for me. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure there's a lot better places than what I found up there. As far as facing sonar this year, I've seen a lot more fish that I didn't know that were up there and caught them in practice, but just the confidence isn't there yet to fully go up there and do it in a yeah. tournament. Speaking of current and fishing the river system, what do you prefer? Do you, do you prefer the, the main lake? Do a little bit of uh, both? I mean, you, you got the St. Clair River, you got the Detroit River. I assume a lot of that current-related fishing, it's a little different than what you find on the main lake of, say, St. Clair. If you would ask me this question last year, I would say St. Clair 100%. But now I've literally fished this whole entire year in the St. Clair River. Really? Um, yeah. It spent every tournament up there, even going to the championship, and I zeroed and came all the way back to St. Clair. With that being said, uh, that river system is, both river systems are phenomenal at some point of the year. The Detroit River is kind of overlooked a lot. A lot of people know about the fall run and the Lake Erie mouth of the Detroit River. But that river's got 20-pound bags in it the whole year. They're just a lot harder to find, and they're not grouped up as much where the St. Clair River gets a lot of the bigger bags, potentially you 24, 25, 26 pounds up there um, with some big kickers. But it usually happens when we have like a long, hot summer. It's a lot deeper, the cooler water. This year, the fish stayed up there a lot longer than normal. Usually you get a little shallow run early and then they kind of vanish, And but they stayed up there the whole year, even up to the practice of our last day of the tournament in September this year. Uh, didn't turn out tournament day, but um, it does. It was good the whole entire year. Talk to me about some of your uh, most memorable tournament fishing, whether it be a win or just a high finish or just something crazy. Like, what's a unique uh, story that that sticks out in your in your mind? I guess our we fished uh, Great Lakes Super Series Championship this year. I like to say we had I call them A, B, C, and D spots. Our A spot was about 35 miles away mm -hmm. and we thought we'd go up there and then work our way back and maybe not use B, C, and D. This year we ran 35 miles, spent three hours, never caught a fish, came all the way back to plan B in the lake and then never caught another fish and pulled up to plan C and still never caught a fish at noon right. and pulled up to plan D and put 22 and a half pounds in the boat and seven casts. Really? Um, wow. It was, it was quick. Then day two, we just stuck with plan D. Um, me and my partner had a funny joke this year. We had a great success in that tournament series this year. I think our worst finish was seventh, and we weighed in over 20 pounds every tournament. But we never weighed a five-pounder. We each lost wow. a couple of them the whole year. We had a bunch of four and three quarters. Uh -huh. So day two of the championship, we're uh, talking and just getting ready kicked off. And I'm like, today would be a good day to catch a five-pounder. And on my third cast, I caught a five-four. So mm, yeah. kind of set up the day, day pretty good. And we ended up winning. Um, we had 23 and change on day two or almost 24, 20, 23, nine, I think. So these A, B, C, D spots. So obviously a, you felt like it was the right choice right away. Did you have some fish in practice or what made you make that run to go burn up three hours for no reason? It was, uh, an area we used in a tournament prior. My partner went up and said, I'm going to check it. I kind of didn't think it was going to be good. And he caught a, like a four and a quarter and it had about 15 buddies with it that he mm. said were a lot bigger. Okay. Um, we do a lot of our tournament fishing on buddy fish and trying to utilize our sonar to see how many fish are there. So we don't kind of catch too many of them. Try to anyways. Right. It doesn't always work out that way, <laughs> no. but we were pretty confident with the spot that we could pull up there and maybe catch 20, 21 and then come all the way back to the lake and maybe catch, you know, a kicker or two, but it did not pan out. I think I caught like a 12 inch smallmouth up there in three mm -hmm. hours. And we came back to the lake with absolutely nothing. So what's going on in your head at that point? Because this is a championship, right? It's like a kind of a big deal. You're here. You got, you want to, you want to do something. I mean, at that point after B and C, it's not working out. How do you maintain that focus? What was kind of the attitude in the boat at noon? Well, when we pulled up the plan C and we never caught a fish and we were catching a bunch of walleyes mixed in with our smallmouth on plan C on the lake. It was just like a little grass bed, a little eelgrass bed, maybe the size of a football field. 
but there was like hundreds and hundreds of walleyes mixed in. Like you'd have to catch 10 walleyes and then you catch a five pound smallmouth. Hmm. But when the walleyes weren't there, I kind of started panicking and saying, because I knew plan D was, there was fish there, maybe 20 pounds, I thought, uh -huh. um, just by practice. But I, I don't spin out very well, but at that time I told my partner, I said, we're going to have to catch him on plan D and I don't think it's going to go that well. Right. And he looked at me and he goes, oh, we're fine. We still got two hours left. And I said, okay. And we pulled up and did it in about seven minutes. So Wow. So you went right back next day and they were sitting ready. We hunk we hunkered down the whole day. We had a couple. Uh, the second place boat was within a football field of us. And the third place boat was in within a football mm. field of us. And we had another weekend just guy out there kind of sure. sharing all the same fish. But okay. when you kind of get on those pods of fish, it's it's sometimes like, Keith Wagner always tells me, he goes, sometimes these schools are a mile by a mile. I never find them a mile by a mile. I like <laughs> right. to find them a little bit smaller than that and find the key areas they're going to key in. But mm -hmm. what was unique about that is we were on uh, perch eating smallmouth and the boat that was, you know, maybe 300 yards away from us was on a shad bite. Okay. They were spitting shad. Um, and that's mm -hmm. just how unique that school was. They were moving in and out and changing all day. That gets me fired up. I love to, uh, it's been, a, it's been a few years since I fished St. Clair. It's, uh, it's an unbelievable fishery. What's your, what's your biggest smallmouth to date? Uh, I caught a six, seven in, uh, tournament practice in the St. Clair river on a drop shot. Drop shot. It was, yeah. yeah. I haven't actually caught that many six pounders living here. Caught a whack whack full of uh five pounders but i think i only got five over six yeah and, you know uh, it's it it's interesting because especially this season when we're talking with guys that fish tournaments all over the country and we've interviewed guys from the west coast down south tennessee the carolinas even the the guys in the carolinas like some of these lakes like you would think but it's hard to get a six, seven plus largemouth or a smallmouth. A five pound bass, I don't care what part of the country you're in. I mean, maybe guys are argued down in Texas or Florida or, or whatnot. I mean, that's a big fish, and especially up north, you know, the bodies of water that you're fishing, those fish are extremely old and they just don't get that big. It's it's rare to to find one much larger than six pounds. I mean, it really is. There's of course plenty of fives out there. It's getting over that threshold sometimes. And so you said you caught it on a drop shot. I'm, I'm curious. I ask everybody on the podcast this, this final question. I'd love to know if you had to use one bait for the next season and one bait only, what would that bait be? Oh, that's a tough one. Probably a swim bait just because of how versatile I, I make it. I throw it on a lot of different techniques. Um, I fish it like a tube sometimes. I throw it on drop shot. Fish it standard as a swim bait. It's a pretty versatile bait that I don't think a lot of people use it um, to its full extent sometimes. Well, we got to go a step further because a swim bait can be a, a variety of different companies and brands out there. If you had to narrow it down to one particular brand and then color, what would that be? 95% of the time I'm throwing a Kytex fat swim, uh, fat Kytex, the swing impact and I would say probably 70% of the time I throw a smallmouth. I think it's smallmouth candy or think that's Ma what it magic is. Or candy. smallmouth magic. That's magic. What it is. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. It's just a good staple. I mess around with it with some dyes once in a while and change the color of it, but it's just a confidence bait. I'm sure you can go out there and throw any color on yep. well any day and someday they catch them, but it's what I gain confidence in. And sometimes no, that's what listen, I just that, recommend. That color is is a color i haven't used a whole lot it's very similar to colors i i use but that color you're you're mentioning came up a few times when we talked with anglers particularly in that region st Clair. Yeah. i think there's something about that that gets the job done whether it be matching the bait fish or whatever the case may be but yeah it's hard to argue that you talk for a few more hours, of course, about this. This is some great information. I'm uh, I'm excited. I'm going to get my spy bait rods uh, and baits geared up. So great stuff. Listen, how can people keep up with what you got going on and, and follow you on social media and, and some of the companies that, that help support you? Follow me on Instagram, D underscore S96. That's pretty well all I do for social media. Tactical Fishing Gear is a new company. Exciting new line of rods that just came out. Five spinning rods. Uh, a couple new soft plastics. There's a Gobi that I prototyped last year that's... Uh, 
it's a phenomenal little bait and there's mm. not nothing like it on the market it's scented crazy durable plastic talk to but, me about this so tactical fishing gear and there's a lineup of soft plastics as well yep it's uh it's a it's actually my company i helped uh design it with a partner of mine we took an idea and ran with it with a bunch of spinning rods and then we kind of got into the soft plastic game i kind of wanted a ned rig goby and a, a drop shot goby living on the great lakes the you know the poor boys erie darter was you know a staple for so many years and the goby came out and it's it's kind of what their main forage was for so many years lake erie not so much on st Clair anymore but when you get up to thousand islands you know eastern lake erie even uh simcoe is pretty good for goby baits up there too but yeah there's a 3.25 inch goby it's it's a stellar little bait are those on the market now can people go check those out yeah, you can go to orderbaits.com, order them up. They're coming a uh, little clamshell. I promise you, once you get them in your hands and you see the durability of them and the scent, you're right. you're going to fall in love. Awesome. We're going to put that link down below if anyone wants to check that out. I know that's where I'm heading right after this podcast, man. Good stuff. I really appreciate you coming on. You're always welcome back, man. This is a great conversation about what I love to do, catch those big smallmouth. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Awesome. And as always, guys, until next time, we'll see you on the water. Thanks so much for listening today. Make sure that you're subscribed to the show and follow us on Instagram at Small Mouth Crush. Also, the YouTube channel, Small Mouth Crush. And if you feel so inclined, please leave us a five-star rating and comment with a review below. And as always, until next time, we'll see you on the water.